Thanks for joining me today. I'd like to talk with you about restructuring Social Security for gender equity. Most of us would agree that Social Security in America certainly has opportunities for improvement. In fact, a few would argue that we'd be better off without it. Women are more at a disadvantage today than men. Disproportionate numbers of women, in fact, are near poverty level. Social Security is their sole means of support. They have no investments or no assets of any kind. Why are so many women at such a disadvantage, you might ask? Well, raising families is really a big priority for them. Parental involvement essentially in keeping their kids on track has put them off track. Why should we be more supportive of women in improving Social Security benefits for them in a world full of distractions and disconnects for families, being a stay-at-home mom builds stronger foundations for everyone. The government, in fact, has taken small steps to establish support. For instance, in September 2009, Family Day was established, which supported by President Obama, every governor in the U.S., and more than a thousand mayors and city executives and officials all across this country has become known as a a recognition of sorts for stay-at-home moms. And despite these circumstances, today many women are refused Social Security benefits due to not earning enough work credits before they turn age 65. They're penalized for being homeowner, homemakers. And in fact, some women are having experienced with double jeopardy, meaning single working moms, for instance, who cannot take advantage of a 401k opportunity at work because they need the income. There really is no credible reason why we penalize women in this way. But still, being a homeowner is not recognized as an occupation, when in fact there is a job description and specific duties are entailed, like raising children, caring for a home, providing love and support for their families. Although homemaking is not a valid occupation, I do believe that it is one. And unfortunately, our current system penalizes women who choose it. So I would submit to you now is the time for Social Security reform. And with legislation on the Senate floor that can provide women with a guarantee acknowledging that nothing will jeopardize their Social Security benefits if they take the time out of their workforce years to raise their children. Women need to know that they can be helped to the highest standards in the courts of law in order to count on Social Security benefits in the future and they will not end up in poverty during their senior years. Losing Social Security benefits is very real as a possibility for women but unless we are able to make swift changes in the current system it will never become a reality. The good news is Congress can make a difference but will take more of a unified approach on their part between Republicans and Democrats if it's going to get done. If Congress takes action, they can impact the future for Social Security for women by offering things like productive activity qualifications, credit for unpaid labor, benefits with race and social classifications. All could make a difference. There are several contributing solutions worthy of consideration. Some have greater potential than others. I would like to explore some of these with you tonight, and we will discuss some of the possible advantages and disadvantages as well. In 2007, the Parents' Tax Relief Act is a bill that was introduced into Congress. It offered real benefits to families with minimum credit allowance for stay-at-home moms and dads with one or more children under the age of seven. A full-time homemaker is not a job yet recognized by the Social Security Administration. It's not a work-for-pay occupation. Homemakers do not receive Social Security benefits. If that bill were enacted, it would greatly encourage families to spend more time together without feeling penalized. The opportunity for reforming Social Security for women does exist. However, many proposals that have been presented in the past are flawed, and for that, they are also class-based. I'll give you some examples. For instance, increasing revenue by raising taxes 
it could be a way of introducing an increased total funding overall. However, with that comes a few different disadvantages. Number one, women are already living at or below poverty lines, which could end up making them suffer even more economic hardship if we were to enact such a bill. Critics also counter that the burden of saving Social Security for women falls to the workers who are currently the youngest and in most cases those with the least amount of confidence in our system as it is today. Moreover, many Americans staunchly oppose tax increases of any kind. Another idea would be to decrease the amount of benefits to the affluent, for example, and shift more benefits to women and those who are in need. But the adverse effect on that would be on the highest earners who already receive proportionately less and would argue that it is no, no benefit to them, therefore why would they vote for it? Raising the age of eligibility to 70 for all of Social Security might help boost funding for Social Security as a whole, but for women, according to Social Security Administration's own statistics, this would ultimately be harmful because they are disproportionately more likely to retire early. Politics of aging is a major factor, of course, and people who vote on these issues are not always the ones necessarily that benefit from them. According to Robert Binstock, uh, who is a political scientist and professor of aging health and society at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, he says, assumptions that older people vote as a benefits block are wrong. Up until now, elderly as a diverse population are as diverse in politics as they are in the social sphere. In fact, many are called greedy geezers. It's a term that has become synonymous with the elderly as a, uh, a stereotype, if you will. We see movement in the future toward a more solid elderly voting blocks with less class divisions. However, today, in this generation of time that is stereotyped as greedy geezers, because they continue to push the envelope on opposition when it comes to Social Security and Medicare reductions, we may not see much movement in that direction of eliminating that trend. It, it does still affect women in particular, however, because women are misrepresented by such stereotypes, and it's a negative one. So achieving a successful elderly voting block to be more supportive for women is complicated, most would agree. Aside from gender type, there are many other separate cohort subgroups among the aging. Certain political issues can either positively or negatively affect their members. Cohorts really are as vast and as differed as there are people in this country. Each set of cohorts has a significantly different priority set than just male or female. And in fact, of each other, of the cohorts themselves within the elderly population. For example, there's young old cohorts, those who were raised in the 1950s, post-war influence, from the Industrial Revolution and their core values really would affect their voting decision making. The sandwich generation, a younger set of cohorts in the elderly, grew up during Kennedy-Johnson period. Uh, technology and science advancements really ensured them a brighter future filled with opportunity and despite the social uprisings that took place in the mid-1960s, they're going to have a positive outlook. The oldest old 75 plus years of age, not as active politically, but perhaps the most needy politically, our voting results that we can see demonstrate very little in terms of proportion coming out to vote in this cohort. Race and cultural issues are also a big cohort contingency that needs to be considered. If you continue to dominate voting decisions based on cohorts, you have things like age, and race and culture all contributing and blending together. For instance, in the last presidential election, African Americans and Latinos alike came out in record numbers for Obama. Another big area of concern, baby boomers. Sheer volume of voters only takes a small margin to change to make a difference in the outcome of any election. Anticipation in the future is that baby boomers can and will have a market impact on elections going forward. 